Welcome back to chapter 10, section two. We're gonna keep talking about memory. In these last two sections, we're gonna keep talking about ways to improve your memory and basically the process of what happens when our memory fails. So um, improving your memory, a strategy for helping you remember things, whether it's a sequence of numbers, whether it's a grocery list, whatever, is chunking. So a chunk is a piece of something. So if you have a long string of numbers, you're able to kind of break them down into manageable parts. When we try to memorize a phone number, usually the first chunk we try to memorize is the area code. So the three numbers at the beginning, we put those into a chunk, whether it's 864, 803, 502, 801, whatever. Um, so we do the area code first. Then we know in a phone number, there are three other numbers that come before the final four digits. So usually the way that we chunk up a phone number is area code, first three digits, last four digits. Now, the number sequence below is a completely random string of numbers. 17761492181241941. If I were to ask you to memorize those numbers, all of you probably would struggle. But if I were to tell you to think of the numbers in groups of four, you would see 1776. 1776, that number sticks out in people who know American history because that was the year that the Declaration of Independence was signed. So 1776, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. 1812, the War of 1812, 1941. When we think of the chunks of numbers as meaningful units, we're able to memorize them easier. So the next time you're presented with this huge set of data and you're like, how in the world am I supposed to remember this? Break it up into chunks that mean something to you. Um, another way that we can improve our memory is by the use of mnemonics. Y'all had an assignment where I asked you to come up with a mnemonic device, whether it was um, Reggie Bibb, whether it was PIMDOS, whether it was um, Holmes, whether it was Face, whether it was Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge. There's all kinds of mnemonics that we use pretty much on a daily basis. Um, a mnemonic is essentially an acronym. So you're taking a set of information, the order of something, and you're trying to put it into a way that your brain can remember. So PEMDAS helps us to remember when we do math, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. So it helps us remember the order of operations, what order we're supposed to conduct math functions in. Roy G. Biff helps us to remember the orders of the color of the rainbow red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then Holmes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Those are the five Great Lakes. There's all kinds of mnemonic devices that we use without even thinking about it. Next up. Okay, so if I were to ask you to memorize this sequence, we have CRY826. All right, dog. We have CRY826. The two chunks that I see from this set of data is the word cry. So CRY makes a meaningful word to me, cry. And then 826, three numbers. That's usually pretty easy to remember. Now, countdown, by, countdown from 50 by twos out loud. So 50, 48, 46, 44, 42, 40, 38, 36, 34, 32, 30, 28, 26, 24, 22, 20, 18, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, 2, 0. Can you still remember the sequence that's underneath this orange circle? I remember the first of it was cry, C-R-Y, but truthfully, I can't remember what those last three numbers were. I know there's three numbers, but I can't remember what they were. 826. So our brains are very distractible. So that sequence, C-R-Y 826, was in my working memory. As long as I was thinking about it, I could easily remember it. But when I distracted my brain by counting down from 50s, Counting down from 50 by twos, 
I had to switch what my brain was thinking about. I had to think of the order of the numbers and what they would be in backwards order by twos. As a consequence, this CRY826 went out from the front of my brain. All I could remember was the first three letters, the cry, something that had meaning to me. But those last three numbers, I couldn't remember them in the correct order. I knew there were three numbers, but I could not remember the details. So that's an example of how your working memory can be easily distracted. So when you're texting or playing a game or making a TikTok while your teachers are teaching, you're not retaining the information. It's going to your working memory, but it's not going somewhere long term because you're distracted, just like I was distracted by counting down. Um, we also have something called the spacing effect in memory. So um, studies have shown that our memory is more effective when we're exposed to the same material over a long period of time. So when I do those annoying review games with y'all that you hate, um, I'm trying to bring back to the forefront of your memory all the things that we've talked about in, say, the past week or the past two weeks or the past unit or whatever span of time we're working with. Um, by spacing out the information and by continuing to bring you back to it, I'm helping to move the information into your long term memory. Now, when you cram the night before a test, it may work to help you remember the information for the next day or if you cram in second block before third block or in first block before second block. It may help you in the short term to remember test information. But when we get to something like the final exam, where I ask you information from unit one, hint, hint, unit one will be on the final. Um, when I ask you about that information that you maybe haven't thought about in a long time, that's the spacing effect. The more often you expose yourself to the old information, the more you're going to retain of it. Don't count on cramming to get you through um, all of your finals. Will not be a fantastic method. Okay, so yesterday we talked about maintenance rehearsal. Today we're going to talk about elaborative rehearsal. So to kind of bring this back to your memory, maintenance rehearsal is simply repeating the information and not trying to find any connections. You're not trying to understand it. You're just trying to remember the words or remember the letters or something like that. Elaborative rehearsal is a little bit different. You're taking the information that you have and you're trying to connect it to something that is meaningful to you, something that's gonna make it stick. So if something is elaborate, it's usually decorated, it's um, ornate, it's very detailed. When you think of elaborative rehearsal, think of it that way. It's kind of more fluffed up. You're trying to actually make it look good. You're trying to make it stick. Um, and then distributed practice. If something is distributed, then it's spaced out and there's space between the little chunks. So Studying large quantities of information in small chunks. This is what we do in all of your classes. In all of your classes, your teachers design units. I didn't try to teach you all of psychology in one unit and give you one test at the end. I'm giving you distributed practice. So I teach you chunks of psychology. When we go through a unit, I break your units down into chapters. And then you usually have a quiz after every chapter. I'm trying to distribute your practice to try to um, bring the information to the long-term part of your memory. Okay, so this graph right here is showing you a distinct difference between maintenance rehearsal and elaborative rehearsal. As I said before, maintenance rehearsal is where you're just trying to maintain the information. You're not trying to take it in and create some kind of deep meaning out of it. You're just trying to remember it for memory's sake. Elaborative rehearsal, you're trying to collect the knowledge and move it to your long-term memory. So an example of maintenance rehearsal is cramming for a test. You're not trying to understand your vocabulary. You're just trying to associate words with each other so you can get the question right. Um, a shopping list in your head. A lot of us use notes on our phone when we go to the store. But um, you know, back in the olden days when you had to have paper and pen if you wanted to write something down, um, people would try to remember their shopping lists in their heads. And we still do this sometimes. You know, you leave your grocery list laying on the counter. You just kind of try to pull out of your head what you needed. Um, but you cram the information for things like that. You're not trying to connect it into long term memory. Um, this is not an efficient way to study. Maintenance rehearsal works for the short term, does not work for the long term. Um, elaborative rehearsal is the much more effective method of studying and will help you more in the long run. 
Um, the example that I have for this one is the oh so famous commercial that we have around Greenville. Make the call 864 Hawk Law. If you know nothing about lawyers or you know nothing about attorneys, nothing like that, um, you can remember 864, make, make the call 864 Hawk Law. It's kind of like it gets stuck in your head. Um, the Jay Gilstrap commercials, those are the same way. These are things that get stuck in our head. So when we think, oh, I need a new car, maybe the first thing we think of is Jay Gilstrap because we've been exposed to those commercials for so long. Um, yes. Okay. Right? So that is rehearsal. Okay. So the primacy and recency effect. And this is the effect where you can remember either the first few things of a list or the last few things of a list. If I were to ask you to memorize this list over here to the right, that would be kind of hard. So there's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. There's 13 items there. So we know our working memory can only hold about seven items. So we're gonna have to do some type of rehearsal, whether it's elaborative or maintenance, in order to be able to memorize this list in its entirety and be able to repeat it back. So if you were to just start, okay, three lemons, small onion, Dijon mustard, three lemons, small onion, Dijon mustard, 10 chicken breasts, three lemons, small onion, Dijon mustard, 10 chicken breasts, and then we stop. It's easy to remember the first four items on the list. It's harder to remember the middle items. So because you've had more exposure to the first four or five items, it's easier for you to repeat them. Um, so the primacy effect, if something is primitive, it's early. So the earlier an item is in the list, the better chance you have of remembering it. Like if I were to give you a list of tasks to do, if I told you to um, log on to your computer, go to Google Classroom, open up the chapter nine um, notes, Go to slide 24, take down the vocabulary, um, make sure you write the definition, and then fill out a Google form. Some of you can probably remember, okay, open your computers, but you're like, wait, what was the second and third thing? What were we supposed to do after that? That's the primacy effect. You're able to remember the first few things. And then the last few things, the recency effect. So the thing that you read last, you're able to remember. So. Three lemons, small onion, Dijon mustard, 10 chicken breasts, small jar of garlic, apple cider vinegar, one can of pineapple, one cup of carrots, 12 meatballs, grape jelly, taco seasoning, jar of salsa, and teriyaki sauce. You are more likely to remember grape jelly, taco seasoning, jar of salsa, and teriyaki sauce than you are to remember, say, apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar falls kind of in the middle of that list. You're more likely to remember the top and the bottom, and the stuff in the middle is more likely to kind of get lost. This relates to the serial position effect. So the primacy recency effect, you can also call that the serial position effect. So think of it this way. These top four numbers, these top four sets of letters, excuse me, if I were to ask you to memorize this entire list, it would be easier for you to recall the first four sets of letters rather than all 12 sets of data. So this graph over here, shows the percentage of words that participants were able to recall from 0% up to 90%, and then the position of the word in the list. So this is accounting for the 12 words that we have over here on the side. So um, immediate recall. So this is right after you're exposed to the set of data. So if I were to tell you, you have a minute to look at this data and you have a minute to memorize it, your immediate recall is this red line. So 70% of people are able to remember the first word, T-U-V, Tov, however you want to make sense of that. And then we can see as the position of the word keeps going, so as we get further and further down the list, oh, excuse me, as we get further and further down the list, people are able to remember less and less and less. And then finally, when we get to the last three or the last four words, people have much better recall. Primacy recency and then later recall only the first items were recalled well so if i were to tell you you have a minute to memorize this list and then i immediately quizzed you on it after that minute and then i kept going taught you some other stuff and then i said okay we're going to come back to that list maybe it's an hour later we're going to come back to that list i want you to see how many you can remember most participants 
40% could remember the first word and then slowly their recollection decreased. That's because um, these sets of letters have no meaning. There's nothing we can connect them to to put them in our long-term memory. So without some type of maintenance rehearsal, the recollection of those words slowly keeps falling as time goes on. Okay, so the key to retrieving information in our memory is to know where it's stored. So yesterday, or the last lesson that um, we did, we talked about recall versus recognition. Remember, recall, I'm asking you basically to fill in the blanks, to give me a short answer, to come up with the answer out of your head. In recognition, I'm giving you a set of data that have the possible answers in it, and you have to pick the correct one. This is more like a multiple choice test. This is like matching, things like that. So memory, memory retrieval in which a person identifies an object, idea, or situation as one he or she has not experienced before. So recognition, you're presented with data and you're trying to pick out the correct data. This is easier than recall. So we have some retrieval cues that can help us more easily pick out whatever data we're looking for. So priming, if you um, are painting a wall, usually you put a coat of primer on first, especially if it's a wall that's been newly sheetrocked or whatever. And the purpose of the primer is so that the paint, the color will actually stick better to the wall. If you paint a wall without primer, the wall's literally going to act like a sponge and it's just going to kind of suck the paint in and you're not going to be able to spread it very far. It may also look patchy, stuff like that. So you put the primer on to prep the wall to keep the paint. So priming is a technique for retrieval, for retrieving implicit memories by providing cues that stimulate a memory without awareness of the connection between the cue and the retrieved memory. So this is like when, um, when something, when you're given a set of fill in the blanks, so you know there's a word, maybe you have four blanks and the first letter is T and your object is to create a set of words. Give me just one second. Okay, so if I were to give you Something that looks like this and say, what possible words can be made out of this? Some of the first things you might think of are tear, T-E-A-R. You might think of tour, T-O-U-R. You might think of um, tide, T-I-E-D, T-I-D-E, -E, either way. Um, so the point is the T at the beginning and the three consecutive blanks primes your memory for what words start with T, okay, what words have four letters, and it helps you make a connection. Okay, so if you are presented with the words assassin, octopus, avocado, mystery, sheriff, and climate, and I asked you to memorize those words, I would say, okay, you've got 10 seconds, memorize those six words. All right, assassin, octopus, avocado, sheriff, mystery, climate, okay, gotcha. If I were to take those words away, and an hour later, if I were to show you the four words down here, twilight, assassin, dinosaur, and mystery, by theory of priming, seeing the words assassin and mystery, you're able to kind of narrow down what those six words were. So we know twilight and dinosaur weren't one of the six words we were asked to remember, but by seeing the words assassin and mystery again, it kind of brings back to our brains, oh, okay, yeah, that's what I was supposed to remember. Um, an hour after that, how would we fill in these words? So uh, the top word, ooh. These are all really hard. So I can tell that the second one down is octopus. The other ones, climate down bottom. Oh. Sorry, it was supposed to show you the answers. Okay, there we go. So the top word was chipmunk. I couldn't figure that one out. The second one down was octopus. My brain was primed from the six words before 
to know octopus. I did not get boogeyman. My brain had not been primed. And then the bottom one, climate. So the words octopus and climate, I remembered seeing from another list. So it made them easier to identify in my brain, even when I didn't have all of the letters. Okay, recall. So in recall, you have to reconstruct all of the material yourself. So you have to reach into the depths of your memory and reconstruct everything yourself. Now, we know when we try to pull things out of our brain and reconstruct them, sometimes we can get things wrong. Sometimes we can fill in gaps with information that we thought happened, or sometimes we might miss a part of a story. So the reconstruction process is the alteration of a recalled memory that may be simplified, enriched, or distorted, depending on an individual's experiences, attitudes, or inferences. So let's say today or two weeks ago, your mom got mad at you for not cleaning your room. So she walked in and she was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, Aiden, sorry, Aiden. Um, oh my gosh, Aiden, you haven't cleaned up your room in like two weeks. What is wrong with you? This is terrible. And then walks out. Your brain, if you replay that conversation over and over again, you may convince yourself that your mom stormed in, not that she walked in, but she stormed in and she didn't simply say it, she screamed it. So the more we replay something in our head, we can alter the reconstruction process of recalling a memory. And then we have this thing called confabulation. When we confabulate something, we fill in the gaps of the story that we can't remember. We don't always do this on purpose. Sometimes we're like, oh, I can't really remember what happened after that, but I think this is what happened. That's confabulation. We fill in the gaps of our memory with things that we may have either made up based on our previous experiences or what other people said happened. And this happens all the time. So we have the scenario of a car crash. This happens all the time in people who are asked to tell the police what happened in this crash. So eyewitnesses are attempting to reconstruct the memories of the crash when they're questioned. So a leading question. If a question is leading, it's typically trying to generate a specific response. So if I were to ask you, um, let's see, how do you, how do you scrub your bathroom or how do you clean your bathroom? If I ask you how you scrub your bathroom, I'm implying that you're like, I don't know, down on your knees with a toothbrush scrubbing every tile. But if I just ask you, how do you clean your bathroom? That implies that you're not maybe as detailed about it. So that's a leading question. So the leading question here is about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? A way to maybe make this not so leading is um, about how fast were the cars going when they hit. So if you say that two cars hit, it kind of applies, you know, maybe a bump, it could be hard bumps, but you know, it's not implying something catastrophic. If you say how fast were they going when they smashed into each other, smashing implies that it was a much more destructive force. So this can kind of confabulate and mess up someone's memory. So the accident actually happens like this. I mean, yeah, there's some damage on the blue car, but it's not really that bad. But when you say that the car smashed into each other, suddenly the person depicting the situation imagines smashing, imagines a lot of damage, and it can mess up how um, the person recalls the event. Great. Schemas. Oh, sorry. Schemas. We talked about this when we talked about um, cognitivism. We talked about Piaget and how he believed um, that learning happens as kids mature, all that kind of stuff. So, a schema is the conceptual framework a person uses to make sense of the world. We compared this to a filing cabinet. So your brain is like a filing cabinet. You have different drawers, you have different folders within the drawers. When little kids are young, they know that something, um, they learn a dog for the first time and they learn that dogs have four legs and dogs are fuzzy. So that is their little schema. That is their little file folder for a dog. Then when they encounter a cat, they see something that is fuzzy and it has four legs, so it must be a dog. And then someone corrects them and says, no, that's not a dog, that's a cat. Suddenly they have a new schema called cat. So now they know there are things that have four legs and are fuzzy that are dogs and things that are four legs have four legs and are fuzzy that are cats. So those are schemas, different files we create in our brains. 
Um, edict memory, the ability to remember with great accuracy visual info on the basis of short-term exposure. So your edict memory is when you are shown something and you can remember a lot of details about it. So you remember the texture of something, the color of something, the smell of something, and the sound that it made when it hit the sidewalk. That's edict memory. It's very, very detailed. Um, forgetting. Our brains are prone to forgetting. So we don't store all of the information that we encounter on a daily basis for forever. Over time, we have this process called decay. When something decays, it breaks down. It kind of goes bad. It spoils, things like that. So when we decay in our memories, over time, we kind of tend to forget. It's like um, people who have been feuding since they were in, I don't know, middle school. Maybe these two people have hated each other since middle school. Finally, they get to adulthood and they're like, wait a minute, why did we hate each other? Because the memory of whatever happened has decayed over time. It's broken down as other things have become more important. And then the other side of forgetting is interference. So you try to remember something, but it's blocked by other memories. So maybe you're, um, you're trying to remember um, the last time that you, or maybe you're trying to remember something that's really, really good. Maybe like uh, your first day of school or something like that, but it could be blocked by the memory that your first day of school may have also been the day that a grandparent died. So in trying to recall that first day of school, it's interfered by the overlapping memory of something else. So that's interference. You've got two things that are competing for control of that memory. Um, for me, in eighth grade, I tried out for cheerleading. And on the day that I found out I made the team was also the day that I found out that my grandfather died. So my memory of the day that I made the team, some of the details are kind of sparse and hard to pick out because they were overwhelmed by the memory of the feelings and the family and all of the things that went along with that. So that's interference. Things were blocked. Things were kind of put in the way. Um, forgetting. This doesn't just happen to old people. We forget things all the time. Some of you forget to turn in assignments more frequently than others, but it's fine. Um, forgetting happens at any stage in the memory. It's basically when um, we sense information, we put it into our working memory, we put it into our short term memory. It goes into long term. But somewhere along the way, it gets lost. Forgetting is just when information doesn't make it all the way back into our long term memory and we can't retrieve it for later use. So when we sense some kind of input, our sensory memory takes care of it. The sight, the smell, the sound, the taste, the touch, whatever. Um, and that sensory memory lasts very, very briefly. And then that sensation is taken into our short term memory. Our short term memory encodes the information and tries to help make sense of it. And if we rehearse it, if we maintenance it, it moves into our long term memory. Sometimes between short term memory and long term memory, we lose details because we only put the things that matter to us into our long term memories. We might lose some of the peripheral stuff that don't really matter that much. And then retrieval from long term memory. It could depend. Sometimes it's easier to remember things than it is to remember others. So when you're taking a test, sometimes the stress of taking the test, of trying to recall the information can interfere with your brain's ability to access the information. So if there's a lot of noise around you, that could be considered interference. If there's bright lights, if it's freezing cold in the room, if it's burning hot in the room, these are all things that can mess with your memory and um, make you more likely to forget. Okay. Memory interference, the blockage of memory by previous or new information. So we have interference, which is when something kind of cuts in, and then we have repression. If something is repressed, it is pushed back, it is pushed down, it's hidden. This is usually a defense mechanism to kind of help you cope with something. We see repression a lot in people with either PTSD or have been through some kind of abuse, trauma situation, something like that. And they may repress certain memories to help them kind of get through their life and to kind of cope and move on. It's a way to avoid stress and to avoid anxiety. <clears throat> Amnesia. 
Amnesia is a condition where your memory is lost. For whatever reason, you can't recall. Sometimes this can be due to disease. This can be due to injury. This can also just be due to the breakdown of brain matter over time. <clears throat> so anterograde amnesia. Anterograde amnesia is when you can't form new memories. So you can remember all of the things in your past, but new things are hard to bring into your memory. So maybe your short-term memory doesn't work as well, but your long-term memory works. And then we have retrograde amnesia, the inability to remember information previously stored in the memory. So this is information that you're not able to access from your long-term memory, but you can make new short-term memories. This is like um, people who may be able to remember what they did um, two days ago, three days ago, but they can't remember what they did a week ago, or they can't remember um, where their house was when they were five, things like that. That's retrograde amnesia. You forget all of the old stuff and you can only focus on the newer stuff. Anterograde is the complete opposite. You remember all the old stuff, but you can't take in the new memories. And then we have the taut phenomena, the tip of the tongue. This is when um, you know what you wanna say, but you can't get it out. I do this all the time while I'm teaching y'all. I'll have the perfect example right on the tip of my tongue, but it's like I can't make the neurons between my brain and the motor speech connect, and it's just lost. Tip of the tongue. People say, oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I know what it is, I know what it is. And they're thinking of a word or they're thinking of a phrase in their head, but they can't remember exactly how it goes. So it's a poor match between a retrieval cue and the long-term memory. So you're trying to pull something out of your memory and you've got this vague idea of what you want to say, but you can't make it happen. Tip of the tongue phenomenon. And then um, I have a video linked here of tip of the tongue phenomenon. It's pretty interesting to watch. Hmm. That is the end of chapter 10, friends. So we have finished chapter 10. You can expect a quiz on this. It will be linked in your daily assignments presentation, and I will give you more details on chapter 11 and your upcoming test. Thanks for watching.